salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah, and may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path, asking Allah Azza wa Jal to grant us and you a life upon his path and a, and a death while closely adhering to his guidance and a reunion around him. Allahumma ameen. Welcome back everyone. Uh, Insha'Allah tonight we're going to begin our discussion on the Qur'an. The Qur'an being a miracle, rather the greatest of all miracles, the miracle of miracles and the greatest of proofs for the truth of Islam, for the divine origins of this religion, for the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. You know, we as Muslims, we know this because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, already told us, you know, in the authentic hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, ma min nabiyin illa there was never a prophet that Allah sent except that he gave him some th something, some sign or signs so that the people could believe in him. Proof to endorse the legitimacy of him being God sent. He said, and what I have been especially given, this doesn't mean it's the only proof he's been given, but what he was particularly given, his most distinguishing sign, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said was a wahi, was a revelation that Allah inspired to me. And as a result of it, it here is the Qur'an. As a result of the Qur'an in particular, I am hopeful that I will have the most followers out of them all, meaning more than all the other prophets, when the day of judgment happens, when the final count uh, and tally takes place. And you know, interestingly that uh, when uh, the Pew Research Center and others, other polling agencies were uh, measuring what is it that's behind Islam being the fastest growing religion in the US or in the uh, UK or in Europe at large, why does it have such a rapid rise, even though there's bad press, it still has such a rapid growth among populations, when they polled these people that why did you choose Islam, the number one and number two reasons were, it just makes sense. And number two is, I got to read the texts myself. Okay, I didn't have to just believe someone, I had access to the text, and what I found in the text just makes sense. And so the hadith tells us that the greatest proof of Islam and the greatest reason for people to become Muslim and followers of the Prophet والسلام, would be the Quran and we're seeing that today. What I want us to do now is to inshallah get a little better uh, and a little sharper in our ability to articulate that uh, to others. What is it about the Quran that makes it so compelling, so convincing? You know, it, it is understandable that the Qur'an have the greatest impact because people get to witness it firsthand. It's not like a moment in history where a physical miracle took place and then sort of you have to believe the testimony because there's good reason to believe the testimony if there happens to be good reason. Okay, it's understandable in that sense. The Qur'an is still with us today. But what could be hard to understand is how could any work of, of literature, how can a book, right? <laughs> Letters and words and pages ever constitute a miracle? How does it qualify as a miracle? And what I want to argue, inshallah, for the next few Fridays is that there are many dimensions. It's multidimensional. There's many dimensions of the Qur'an's miraculous nature. Some of them will be more appealing to certain audiences than others. You may speak to someone who he can't appreciate one angle of the miracle, uh, but they can appreciate another. You know, because some people will reduce it to say it's, it's a linguistic miracle. And we will start talking about linguistics, you know, in a second. Uh, but what if I just, you know, I'm not uh, able to appreciate the Qur'an being a linguistic wonder? There are others, because Allah knew that this Qur'an, yes, it's Arabic originally in its message, but it's universal, right? In its target audience for everybody. And so there will be other dimensions we will discuss, but let's start from the ground up. How is the Qur'an a linguistic masterpiece? Tell me. Quickly. How? 
No, no doubt it is. I'm not downplaying this. But how? You see, this is the issue. We cannot be sloppy <laughs> when we make this argument. There is a correct way to make it. But you and I both will struggle to actually prove in a convincing way that the Quran is a linguistic masterpiece. You can say, yes, but the Arabs were like really good at language. And if you compare the Quran to like the poetry of the time, which was like, you know, high level poetry, the Quran knocks it out the, the park. Really? Can you take a page of Quran for me and compare it with a page of poetry for me? I can't do it. I'll be honest with you. I can't. So should we put this proof uh, uh, down altogether because we cannot ourselves demonstrate that linguistically it has no comparison? No, there's still ways to do it. Here's how. You with me? All Quran experts, Muslim and non-Muslim, past and present, generally agree that the Quran linguistically is in a league of its own. The more you go up the, the ladder of expertise, the less the debate there is. You know, someone who cannot even spell their name in Arabic, like, yeah, the Quran's there's nothing impressive about it. It's like monotonous. And it's like, you know, it's jumping all over the place. He doesn't know where to begin evaluating. But the more you go up the ladder, whether you're Muslim or you're non-Muslim, you're a contemporary scholar of the Quran, or you're one of the, the greats of the Arabic language from classical times, they all agree that the Quran is in a league of its own. They'll disagree on its source. Some say, yeah, it's in a league of its own, but I'm not saying it's from God. Because they're obviously not. They're non, some of them are non-Muslims here. But they don't disagree, even despite disagreeing on the source, they don't disagree on it linguistically being a masterpiece. And that's important. Allah sent the Quran, framed it in a way, form, as if Muhammad brought about a new language to the Arabs, a new language to the Arabs, when they would brag to the world that no one has the rhetoric, no one has the language that has our sophistication. You know, a, a non-Muslim, uh, Palestinian-American uh, scholar of literature and culture, one of the, Oxford calls him one of the foremost uh, scholars of uh, public intellectuals, they call, them, they call him, Edward Said, uh, who, who passed away about 20 years ago. Um, he says... Anyone who understands the Arabic language will realize, as I realize, and I consider, in my opinion, that the Arabic language is one of the most extraordinary constructions of the human mind. It's hard to compare Arabic, to begin with, with other languages. Okay? Yet these people, who were experts in Arabic, don't understand how the Quran was formulated. And I'll share with you a few citations uh, to prove the fact that everyone who tried to create something like the Quran linguistically failed. And what do we mean they failed? The challenge of the Quran was to produce surah min mithlihi, produce one chapter. The shortest chapter of the Quran is what? It's two lines, right? Produce one chapter, not identical to it, similar. وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ And you go call your own judges. Can you imagine <laughs> how low it is the bar right now? We'll create one chapter like it that is just similar to it and go call someone from your side, your biased judges to testify for it. When Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the illiterate man who couldn't read and write, brought you 6,200 plus verses of it. Right? That's the challenge. So it seems to be like, come on, who can't put that together? Why can't you get a think tank of 10 experts to put that together? Someone's going to be able to do it. Yet all the experts agree, nobody ever came close. So, for instance, uh, this is uh, the statement of... Uh, the German scholar, non-Muslim, German professor, University of Berlin, she wrote, that's the cover of the book or the English translation of it, it was originally written in German, she wrote a six-volume commentary on the Qur'an. She's considered one of, or, yeah, she's still alive, she's about 80 right now, one of the greatest scholars and experts on Qur'an in the world today. She says, and this is an interview, this part is not in the book, she says, no one has succeeded at meeting that challenge. This is right. She goes, I attest to that. No one has. 
And I really think that the Quran has even brought Western researchers embarrassment, the way they were dismissive of it, she means. Who weren't able to clarify how suddenly in an environment where there was not any appreciable written text, there appeared the Quran with its richness of ideas and its magnificent wordings. There's another quote here. I'll get all the, the quotes out of the way and then we'll discuss inshallah that I really appreciate for Dr. Basim Sayyah in his book and uh, he writes, this book is called The Miraculous Language of the Quran. <clears throat> he says, the miraculousness of the Quran. How can language be a miracle, right? He says, lies in this very paradox. Paradox means like a seeming contradiction, like a deadlock. The paradox of its being truly Arabic. Anyone who hears the Quran knows it's Arabic. They can understand it, right? It being truly Arabic and it being at the same exact time a new language. He says that might appear to be illogical. Like how is it Arabic and not Arabic at the same time? He said the logic of miracle in here exists in precisely the fact that it surpasses logic. You're telling me how is it logical that it's Arabic and not Arabic? It's a, he goes, that's the whole point. You see, a miracle that rests on logic ceases to be a miracle. He's trying to say, you need to grasp the Arabic language, extremely sophisticated, extremely mature, extremely advanced, right? These people were at the peak of rhetorical expression, meaning they had not just great skill, they had great strictness in their structure. Like there's a there are clear benchmarks, they all understand rules you have to play by. If it doesn't fit into these 16 rules, it doesn't qualify. It's shallow, it's a failure, it's a mistake. In other words, he's telling you the beauty of Arabic is not arbitrary. You understand? It's not like, oh, I feel like this language is beautiful. He's saying, no, Arabic is a very strict language. Not difficult, by the way, compared to many other languages because it's so consistent, so well structured. But there's structure. You step outside that structure, it's not Arabic. Right? So there's, for example, like 16 measures they talk about in poetry. He's saying the Quran spoke outside of these 16, yet everyone said, wow, that's exquisite Arabic. So it's n not Arabic, doesn't fit the definition. Right? At the same time, it is the most coherent pristine, crystal clear, lucid Arabic. And that is why if you look historically, you start finding the great poets of Arabia, like Labid ibn Rabi'ah or otherwise, they not just became Muslim, but they retired from poetry when they encounter the Quran. Say, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to write another stanza, another couplet of poetry after this. And this is why also, when they went to Al-Walid ibn Mughira, who was a staunch enemy of the Prophet والسلام, they said to him, go listen to him and tear his Quran apart. So he said this, right? He, he went and listened to the Quran careful and he came back and he said, what can I possibly say? There is not a single man among you who is more versed in prose or in poetry than I am. Even the poems of the jinn, the demons, I memorized them. <laughs> I know of them. By God, what he says bears no resemblance to any of these things. His just completely outside the box. By God, his statements which he utters have a sweet, has a sweetness to it and a charm hovers over it. Then he explains. He said its highest parts, its surface meaning, are fruitful. You know sometimes when you read something, at first glance it seems to be profound, right? But that you can't do much with it. Or if you think about it a bit further, it's actually very problematic. He's saying its surface level is very fruitful. It's not algorithms, it's not complicated, it's, you can use it. He said, and its depth, the further you dig deep into it, you scrutinize it, gushes forth without end. It's just endless beauty. He said it dominates and cannot be dominated and it will certainly crush all that's beneath it. This language can never be matched, he's saying. And so now you have a non-Muslim or a Muslim in those citations from the books I showed you. And this is the best of the best of the early experts in the Arabic language. He said this. So they told him, you know what happened when he said that? They said to Al-Walid, they said, people, they were afraid he was going to go out to the world and tell them this and admit this. He said, people are saying that you're going broke and you're going to start following Muhammad. You're going to become a Muslim so he can spend on you. 
And Walid ibn Mughira was the richest guy in Mecca. And he took great pride and great boast in his wealth. All of Quraysh would put in money to dress the Kaaba one year, and he would dress the Kaaba by himself every other year. Right? And so they hit him where it hurts. People are going to start saying, I'm not the richest man in Mecca anymore. I'm sort of going to go become a, you know, someone begging of Muhammad. And so they said, then say something. Dismiss the Quran. He said, what can I say? No one's going to believe everything, anything I say. Storyteller, he doesn't speak like storytellers. Fortune teller, doesn't speak like a fortune teller. He said, the best thing we can say, our best odds, let's align on an accusation. Let's call it sihrun yu'thar. And this whole incident that I just relayed is in the beginning of Surah Al-Mudathir. Let's just call it magic. Of course, this is from the blindness that Allah Azza wa Jal at times gives those hearts that are deserving of going blind, that turn away from the truth. You know when you call it magic, you know what you're doing? You're actually admitting what? That it's supernatural. Right or wrong? So unwittingly, unrealizing, he's conceding to the fact that this book is not from this world. And of course, people didn't buy that even though they settled on it. And that is why, and that's why the sword is there. That is when things turned hostile for the Prophet ﷺ. And that is yet another proof of the Quran being matchless. Would you call it magic? Right? Unless you couldn't compete with it? And would you reach for your sword? This is what Al-Baqillani rahimahullah said in his book, The Inimitable Quran. He said, would you reach for your sword unless you were failed by your word? Their words failed, and so they were compelled to reach for their swords. Why else? Why would you go to war? Why would you kill your fellow tribesmen? Why would you kill your own family members? Why would you go broke? Why would you subject yourself to being killed? And all this, unless you really believed you had no other option. Right? So that is of the further proofs that it was not match, uh, could not be matched. The last point I'll mention here, and I'll spend a bit of time on this last slide. I am not comparing the Prophet ﷺ to Shakespeare. There's always someone in the crowd who says this is an insult to the Prophet ﷺ to compare him to Shakespeare. This slide is about what? One of the uh, experts on the Quran, non-Muslim, Orientalist scholar, his name was Arthur J. Arbery. By the way, Arthur J. Arbery has his own translation of the Quran. <laughs> but he's not Muslim, he's not very fond of us either. Uh, but he's a, he's a specialist, he's a scholar. He writes, I think he wrote this in the intro of the, his translation of the Quran, that there is no doubt that the Qur'an is a unique masterpiece of the Arabic language. Forever, Muslim, Christian or not, if you're Arab, you measure your Arabic by comparing it with the likes of the Qur'an. Okay? He says, but Muslims shouldn't exaggerate. Muslims shouldn't take it from being the best league of its own, top of its class, to exaggerating and saying it's from another world. It's otherworldly, it's supernatural. He's saying that's unjustified. Why? He says because every language has its top work of literature. In English, you have the sonnets of Shakespeare. In Greek, you have the Iliad of Homer. And so the Quran is no different. It's just the Quran of Arabic. That's all. So in his rush to be dismissive of the Quran's divine origins, he made a, a huge oversight. <laughs> Ten oversights, at least. Uh, and this was taken from the, the book of Dr. Sami Amiri, or adapted from the book of Dr. Sami Amiri, who's a great uh, Algerian scholar in comparative religion uh, out of Minnesota. Uh, let us sit there and compare and contrast for a second or ask, can Muhammad ever be compared to Shakespeare? Or let me reverse that. Can Shakespeare ever be compared with our Prophet Muhammad? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So number one, which one of them, Muhammad or Shakespeare? <laughs> was formally educated, had access to books and libraries. Shakespeare, right? The Prophet ﷺ was not just uh, uneducated in reading and writing, but he was from a people that were majorly un unlettered. The whole society, illiteracy was the norm, was prevalent there. And he worked in his life as a 
shepherd of sheep, and in some instances as a tradesman. Whereas Shakespeare was educated uh, in Greek and in Latin, right? Multiple languages and had access to books and libraries of them. Number two, who wrote for a living? The Prophet ﷺ never wrote. Shakespeare was a professional playwright. He was dedicated, salary coming in, to refine his craft day in and day out, year after year, one play after another, right? Number three, who brought a new compositional structure to their language? I already explained what that means in Arabic, that he was speaking outside of every norm of rhetoric known to the Arabs, who were experts at rhetoric, at speaking. Shakespeare's, what are Shakespeare's poems, for those of you who had to get dragged through this in school, I had to for more semesters than I wanted, uh, the trauma of an English major. Uh, he's, it was called sonnets, right? You guys know what sonnets are. Like, you know what haikus are? That's an easier, what's a haiku, guys? Yes, right? There's three-line poem, every line has to match up to a certain measure of syllables, right? Sonnets are like that. There's a certain form you have to... Did Shakespeare invent sonnets? No, sonnets were being used for hundreds of years before Shakespeare. Got it? As for the Prophet والسلام, he spoke, meaning the Qur'an that he brought, stepped outside of every known structure of composition in the language. Nobody before ever used that, and wait, nobody after it ever was able to replicate it. Completely different. Number four, the stylometric test. What's a stylometric test? That's just a big clunky uh, word. Uh, stylometrics is... Uh, it's basically a, a mathematical comparison. It's software that has been produced uh, in, in, recent, in, in recent times that they call it author discrimination. How do you discriminate this is really from this author or not from this author? Okay? So basically, it's almost like AI, <laughs> but a very primitive form of AI uh, or plagiarism softwares or otherwise. Imagine I, we, we, we dig up in, in the park down the street, a book that says, manuscript written by William Shakespeare. We're not sure if it's actually one of his books or not, one of his plays or not. So what do you do? They input it into the software, right? After they've already input everything we know and verified has been from Shakespeare. So they already got his patterns of language, his styles and otherwise. Immediately you can tell, is this actually his? Does it match up or does it, does it not? Is that clear? By the way, this author discrimination uh, technique is, is how they discounted and disproved that many of the books in the Bible that are attributed to even Paul were not even written by Paul himself. Paul, the creator of Christianity. But what they did is they performed 12 different experiments comparing what? The Quran with a book like Sahih al Bukhari. Sahih al Bukhari, you know, is the most authentic. You know, a collection of statements and descriptions and actions and approvals of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, his everyday speech, basically, to simplify. And what they did when they compared the language of the Quran with the language of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they s concluded that it is humanly impossible for these two to come from the same person. Why? They found, like for example, sixty-six percent of the vocabulary in one book, doesn't exist in the other book whatsoever. So what does that mean? It means it's humanly impossible for you to live 23 years self-policing, uh, self-censoring yourself. I'm only going to use these words on this subject and those words on that subject. Is that even possible? It's not humanly possible for you to regulate yourself in speech that way. Over the span of... The, no one can ever do it. Can you imagine? Like I'm going to say, I'll never say the word house on Sundays. And someone sort of like... <laughs> so this is a way for people to objectively see the Quran could never have come from Muhammad. Whereas the patterns and the styles of Shakespeare are well known to us. You know, the people around the Prophet ﷺ knew this. They knew that these were not his words. We talk to him every day. We grew up with him. He grew up with us. We know how he speaks. 
right? But for someone who cannot compare the, the everyday words of the Prophet ﷺ with the words of the Qur'an, this is sort of like an objective mathematical way for you to know we must differentiate between the source of these words and the source of those words. Can't come from the same person. Clear? Number five. Which one had in their authorship, right? In, in their books, in their writings, in their literature, unwavering eloquence. What does that mean? That means beauty that is consistent. Perfection, mastery of language that never falters. Definitely not Shakespeare. Because every class you take with Shakespeare, no matter who you take it with, they're always going to make you stop at a few words where he really knocked it out the park. It's not like all his plays are equally beautiful. There's, you know, uh, to be or not to be. And there is, you know, all those phrases you know, right? From, from Romeo and Juliet. From, there's segments of distinct brilliance. What about the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ brought? You need to understand, <laughs> the Arabs had a tradition because they were so uh, sophisticated in rhetoric and language called the Naqd tradition. Naqd tradition is like literary critique, basically. You critique each other's language and literature. You know, like in rap battles, <laughs> but on a very different level. So they would basically listen to each other's masterful poetry and say, that was good. But because this was the scene, you should have used that metaphor. Or this conjugation of the verb. Or morph the word this way to about... All they did was brutally scrutinize each other's poetry. That was just the life they were about. Has anyone ever pointed at any room for refinement for any phrase in the Quran? No. Who can pull that off? Number six. Who was it Muhammad والسلام, or Shakespeare that ever challenged their peers? I dare you to make something like what I produce. No, Shakespeare understood and everyone around him understood that he was normal, human, had some skills. By the way, back to Arbery's statement, you know, the sonnets of Shakespeare. The scholars of the English language do not agree on Shakespeare being the number one writer of plays in the English language. They don't. Like Hugh Craig from Newcastle University, one of the authorities of the English language, without boring you guys, he ranks him as number seven, right? There's ikhtilaf. <laughs> it's controversial who's number... Like Shakespeare, yes, was the most well-known. Maybe he had some good connections. Maybe the politicians liked him. Maybe he struck gold. Whatever it is, right? But in terms of the, the strength of the language, no, Shakespeare was just considered by some, not agreed upon, considered by some the champion in an arena of worthy competitors. They could be compared with him. You get it? Whereas the Quran would chastise them and challenge them and lower the bar time and again. The challenge happens in many verses, not just one, to produce anything like this. Come on, nothing. Ten chapters, one chapter. Bring your own uh, judges, anything, whatever you want, right? And in humiliation, they all were what? Were silenced. Number seven. Who had the luxury of the flexibility of fiction? What does that mean? You know when you're just writing fiction? Fiction means fantasy. Fiction means not real. You can like talk about whatever you want, right? And that was Shakespeare. He's writing plays, he's writing romance, he's writing drama, right? He's just fiction. So you would expect that his language would be more appealing, right or wrong? The Quran that the Prophet Muhammad brought us, alayhi salatu wasalam, is forced to speak about reality. I'm using the word forced loosely here, isn't it? Tough subjects, right? Theology and philosophy and law and uncomfortable truths about diseases that lurk in people's hearts and refuting and rebutting false, you know, uh, paradigms or worldviews or beliefs and doctrines. And you know, when experts start speaking on like the, on these levels, people usually just zone out. It's like, the language just becomes very heavy, right or wrong. And so that you would more of an advantage, right? 
because of the inflexibility of facts and truth and non-fiction that the Quran came with. Okay? Number eight, now this is a build on it, which one of them has universal appeal? Like if I were to lose my mind and, you know, coordinate a play, a Shakespeare play in the social hall next week, besides the fact that you guys would get me thrown out of the masjid, besides that one, right? Who would care to show up? English speaking, probably college educated, upper to middle class, probably Caucasian, a very specific slither of the population would ever have interest in something like this. Now, if I were to bring an expert reciter of the Quran to this masjid to recite for you, words that you may not even understand unless they're translated, who would show up for this event if I were to bring Sheikh Mashari al-Afasi or Abdul Rashid Sufi or one of these great reciters of today or Maher al-Mu'ayqli or Sheikh al-Sudais or Shuraim or whoever you prefer to listen to who would come? the Arabs and the non-Arabs and the young and the old and the, everybody, right? the Quran has the universal appeal even though Arabic is not necessarily a universal language in that sense number nine Creative liberty versus interactivity. What in the world does that mean? Let's imagine Shakespeare, okay, is speaking fiction, right? Let's imagine he's speaking nonfiction even. But even with nonfiction, he gets to decide what I'm going to talk about. Let's ignore the fact that it's fantasy. He decides what parts of truth to leave out. Right or wrong? Whereas the Qur'an, the Qur'an was addressing what was happening in real time. Like there are 13 passages in the Qur'an that begin with yas'alunak. They ask you, O oh Muhammad, about the moons, how to count the months. They ask you about how much of their money are they obligated to spend out in charity. They ask you about the menstrual cycle. That's an ayah in the Qur'an, isn't it? Every time they ask, Allah sends out a response. You know how hard it would be? Like imagine I'm putting together what I want to be the most moving, inspiring talk for you about the reality of paradise in the hellfire. Right? I want everyone to walk out being a sahabi. Inshallah. <laughs> and in, that, in those 30 minutes, you guys keep raising your hand, Sheikh, but this issue of like, isn't this wasting light? Isn't this too much light? Can we get some energy savers on here? Like, <laughs> and you just keep asking me questions. Sheikh, but like, I said to my wife, you're divorced four times before the lecture. Is that fine? Like, can I still go home tonight or can I not go home tonight? Because like, I was like a little disoriented when I said it. And every time I try to get back to my subject, you ask me another question. How much interest would I retain in my audience? Not much, right? And it's not even just that they were prompting him with questions. The Qur'an is addressing spontaneous events also. Events are just happening. Like you would think that the Qur'an, if it were produced by a human being, obviously, it would waver in its beauty, in its eloquence at the times when the Prophet ﷺ is going through distress. He's bleeding. He just, he's walking home from a battle. His uncle Hamza radiallahu anh, just got mutilated. If a human production, would it be equally effective, equally thoughtful, equally creative in moments when we're going through trauma versus moments when I'm sitting there calm under a candlelight, sipping my chamomile and then writing it out for you? How did the Quran come out like this? Unwavering eloquence despite the fact that I don't get to speak, right? The Quran is not speaking in a silo. It's interacting with its audience live, right? Last one, and here's the kicker. Which one wrote their book? I know the Prophet did not write the book. I get it. Wrote their book in linear fashion. Assembled the book in linear fashion. Shakespeare, right? Everybody, not just Shakespeare. Who writes back to front? I don't mean direction, like Arabic, English. I mean like the actual subject. Who writes? Everyone writes the beginning, the middle, the end. That's how we write. The top, the middle, the bottom. What we need to realize is the Quran did not come down like this. 
the order of the surahs and the ayat you have right now in the Quran, the chronological order of your mushaf is not the order of descent, the order it was revealed. So the Quran came down, imagine like there's a painting or like a big puzzle and this piece comes down, then that piece comes down, then this piece comes down, then that one. Then add another piece here, then a part over there, and then some over here. Can you imagine that coming out like a beautiful tapestry? Who can ever do that? Who can ever paint that way? And then the Quran is not even written. It is spoken. How do you put together a book that way? That is unmatched by the agreement of the experts. Tanzilum min Rabbil Alameen. There's no other way to explain it. This is a grand miracle that has been revealed from above the heavens. And so that is sort of how the Quran, despite it being a work of language, a work of literature, qualifies with flying colors for being an actual supernatural, out of this world, gift from Allah, a miracle. Inshallah, in the coming Fridays, we will speak about how the Quran and the history, the lost knowledge it shares with us, proves beyond a doubt that it was a miracle and from Allah. And then we will visit other aspects of its miraculous nature, such as its preservation and its potency and its impact on the world and otherwise. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Subhanakallahu wa hamdik. Shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Are there any questions?